Hey there. Subscribe to my channel and also press this bell icon. So you can get latest video notifications. And this is absolutely free. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Swiss Family Robinson by Johann David Wyss Chapter 23 The next morning my wife and children besought me to begin my manufacture of candles. I remembered having seen the chandler at work, and I tried to recall all my remembrances of the process. I put into a boiler as many berries as it would hold, and placed it over a moderate fire. The wax melted from the berries and rose to the surface, and this I carefully skimmed with a large flat spoon, and put in a separate vessel placed near the fire. When this was done, my wife supplied me with some wicks she had made from the threads of sailcloth. These wicks were attached, four at a time, to a small stick. I dipped them into the wax, and placed them on two branches of a tree to dry. I repeated this operation, as often as necessary, to make them the proper thickness, and then placed them in a cool spot to harden. But we could not forbear trying them that very night, and, though somewhat rude in form, it was sufficient that they reminded us of our European home and prolonged our days by many useful hours we had lost before. This encouraged me to attempt another enterprise. My wife had long regretted that she had not been able to make butter. She had attempted to beat her cream in a vessel, but either the heat of the climate, or her want of patience, rendered her trials unsuccessful. I felt that I had not skill enough to make a churn, but I fancied that by some simple method, like that used by the Hottentots, who put their cream in a skin and shake it till they produce butter, we might obtain the same result. I cut a large gourd in two, filled it with three quarts of cream, then united the parts, and secured them closely. I fastened a stick to each corner of a square piece of sailcloth, placed the gourd in the middle, and giving a corner to each of my sons, directed them to rock the cloth with a slow, regular motion, as you would a child's cradle. This was quite an amusement for them, and at the end of an hour my wife had the pleasure of placing before us some excellent butter. I then tried to make a cart, our sledge being unfitted for some roads. The wheels I had brought from the wreck rendered this less difficult, and I completed a very rude vehicle, which was nevertheless very useful to us. While I was thus usefully employed, my wife and children were not idle. They had transplanted the European trees, and thoughtfully placed each in the situation best suited to it. I assisted with my hands and counsels. The vines we planted round the roots of our trees, and hoped in time to form a trellis work. Of the chestnut, walnut, and cherry trees, we formed an avenue from Falcon's Nest to Family Bridge which, we hoped, would ultimately be a shady road between our two mansions. We made a solid road between the two rows of trees, raised in the middle and covered with sand, which we brought from the shore in our wheelbarrows. I also made a sort of tumbrel, to which we harnessed the ass to lighten this difficult labor. We then turned our thoughts to Tent House, our first abode, and which still might form our refuge in case of danger. Nature had not favored it, but our labor soon supplied all deficiencies. We planted round it every tree that requires ardent heat, the citron, pistachio, the almond, the mulberry, the Siamese orange, of which the fruit is as large as the head of a child, and the Indian fig with its long prickly leaves, all had a place here. These plantations succeeding admirably, we had, after some time, the pleasure of seeing the dry and sandy desert converted into a shady grove, rich in flowers and fruit. As this place was the magazine for our arms, ammunition, and provisions of all sorts, we made a sort of fortress of it, surrounding it with a high hedge of strong, thorny trees, so that not only to wild beasts, but even to human enemies, it was inaccessible. Our bridge was the only point of approach, and we always carefully removed the first planks after crossing it. We also placed our two cannon on a little elevation within the enclosure, 
and, finally, we planted some cedars near our usual landing-place, to which we might at a future time fasten our vessels. These labours occupied us three months, only interrupted by strict attention to the devotions and duties of the Sunday. I was most especially grateful to God for the robust health we all enjoyed in the midst of our employments. All went on well in our little colony. We had an abundant and certain supply of provisions, but our wardrobe, notwithstanding the continual repairing my wife bestowed on it, was in a most wretched state, and we had no means of renewing it, except by again visiting the wreck, which I knew still contained some chests of clothes and bales of cloth. This decided me to make another voyage. Besides, I was rather anxious to see the state of the vessel. We found it in much the same condition we had left it, except being much more shattered by the winds and waves. We selected many useful things for our cargo. The bales of linen and woolen cloth were not forgotten, some barrels of tar, and everything portable that we could remove, doors, windows, tables, benches, locks and bolts, all the ammunition, and even such of the guns as we could move. In fact, we completely sacked the vessel, carrying off after several days' labor all our booty, with the exception of some weighty articles, amongst which were three or four immense spoilers intended for a sugar manufactory. These we tied to some large empty casks, which we pitched completely over, and hoped they would be able to float in the water. When we had completed our arrangements, I resolved to blow up the ship. We placed a large barrel of gunpowder in the hold, and arranging a long match from it, which would burn some hours, we lighted it, and proceeded without delay to Safety Bay to watch the event. I proposed to my wife to sup on a point of land where we could distinctly see the vessel. Just as the sun was going down, a majestic rolling, like thunder, succeeded by a column of fire, announced the destruction of the vessel which had brought us from Europe, and bestowed its great riches on us. We could not help shedding tears, as we heard the last mournful cry of this sole remaining bond that connected us with home. We returned sorrowfully to Tent House, and felt as if we had lost an old friend. We rose early next morning, and hastened to the shore, which we found covered with the wreck, which, with a little exertion, we found it easy to collect. Amongst the rest were the large boilers. We afterwards used these to cover our barrels of gunpowder, which we placed in a part of the rock, where, even if an explosion took place, no damage could ensue. My wife, in assisting us with the wreck, made the agreeable discovery that two of our ducks and one goose had hatched each a brood, and were leading their noisy young families to the water. This reminded us of all our poultry and domestic comfort at Falcon's Nest, and we determined to defer for some time the rest of our work at Tent House, and to return the next day to our shady summer home. End of chapter